<laughs> Greetings, everyone. Now that everybody's here, I'm going to go ahead and see how we can proceed in terms of completing your Earth Day projects. And as I noted, um, if we have ta additional time, your individual plan projects, they're still remaining. So remember that for each of these, you're responsible for selecting three things that you think were critical in each presentation, adding those to the ones from your the prior presentation, excuse me, that you have uh, heard, listened to, seen, and um, then submitting that all as a single document. And that would be one of the last uh, documents that you'll be putting in your assign assignment folder there, along with the uh, plan project evaluations. So let's put this together and see if I have everybody I need in here. All right, Andrew, you there? I see you there, I don't hear you. Andrew? Oops. See if he has. Andrew? Hello. Um, you there? Hello. Can you yes, hear me? I'm, yes, okay. I do. Okay, so you're able to present now? Yes. Okay, I'll pull it up then. I want to check before I pull things up. And you did maintaining biodiversity, right? Yeah. Make sure I have the right one. Okay. That's a beautiful shot. Did you take that one? No. <laughs> Honesty is a very good policy. I'm going to nominate you for photographer of the year. Oh, no, I don't deserve that. Oh, well, maybe someday. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, if you would, since you're presenting, if you would put your camera on, if you have one available. Uh, I don't, so okay. uh, sorry, okay. this is the best I could do. Okay, that's fine. Okay. All right, introduce your topic and yourself. Uh, my name is Andrew, and my topic is maintaining biodiversity. Okay, so give them a moment. Know that they have to write this down. Okay. Okay, we good now? No one needs more time. All right. So remember the top three things in each presentation. Go ahead. Uh, what is biodiversity? Uh, biodiversity is the different types of environments and species located around the world, uh, consisting of ecosystems such as the desert, desert, tundra, tropical rainforest, savanna, oceans, etc. Different habitats are, are diverse in different ways between the species that live there to the plants that grow there. Okay, now introduce your diagram. Hit, out, uh, hit highlights of each. Uh, so, as you could tell, there are all very different types of environments so you have the arctic you have the ice so i assume that's like the arctic where the penguins are uh you have the desert uh you have just forests you have the savanna um yeah so basically all the different types of environments most of them i would say okay okay so why is biodiversity important the loss of biodiversity leaves the earth without its essential utilities. Each different ecosystem has a specific job it must do to contribute to the earth. Those necessities include things like oxygen, clean air, and clean water, and providing salvation to animals, along with other things. Okay, to continue the importance of biodiversity. Biodiversity is the direct link to having more species available in an already increasingly extinct planet. 
every single species has an important role to play. An example of this would be sea otters creating and feeding, creating feeding grounds for various fish and multiple marine animals. Okay, may I ask you a question? What is the role of mosquitoes? Uh, do I know the role of mosquitoes? I don't know the role of mosquitoes. Okay, they're part of the food chain. They're required for a lot of birds and a lot of other creatures. But yes, I, I love that you emphasize that even if we don't like a species, for whatever reason, it harms us in some way, it has a role to play just as anything else does. Yeah, absolutely. Spiders. I don't like spiders, but we need them, so. Oh my gosh, spiders are, are complete beneficials, other than the ones that, that kill you. So. Yeah. Okay, so these are just some harsh facts. Uh, while we take it for granted, humans rely solely on the earth and its various ecosystems. The air we breathe and the food we eat is the direct result and pr pr product uh, of nature and its various ecosystems. Uh, fun fact, fish, avocados, and rice don't all come from the same place. How could you eat sushi without biodiversity? Very good. Uh, how are we harming biodiversity? Pollution is the number one contributor to the extinction of thousands of species and wildlife. The things that we release into the air and dump into our oceans is why scientists believe we are on the cusp of another mass extinction. The very ongoing catastrophe known as coronavirus is allowing the earth to heal and breathe as multiple reports have, seen, have shown blue skies in China's factories district and the return of multiple species to their original habitats and a chance to bring back numbers to their once thriving community. Nice note about COVID-19. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, industrial expansion. This is another uh, important topic that's harming uh, nature and biodiversity. The expansion of, of industrial facilities and new cities is the second most harmful factor towards biodiversity. The cutting down of nature to build new real estate is the prime factor affecting the, affecting different environments. Every day we, we, cut and we cut trees and build roadways in order to better our way of life. We cut sides of mountains in order to mine for coal. All these things are just a few reasons why biodiversity is at risk. What city is that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't know. <laughs> That's fair. Good shot. It is. Uh, how do we help biodiversity? Uh, as mentioned previously, the halting of production around the world has shown that the earth is capable of healing and at an extremely fast rate. Now, as the most dominant species must come together and change the way we manufacture and produce or else the future or else all our futures look very bleak. That's it. Thank you. That's cute. I like smelling earth. Nicely done. Thank you. Okay. Casual, are you there? Angela? She's here. No, she's not here yet. We'll have to come back to her. And Robert, you here? Oh, Kajala is here. Kajala, you want to go next? Yeah, Um, I, lit I wasn't home. Can you just give me a, a couple of seconds just to set up here? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Pedro will be speaking on improving water quality. Yes. And it will give me a chance to take attendance.
You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, improving one point here. All right, go ahead. Okay, so um, my part of the Earth Day presentation was presenting or describing improving water quality. That's a beautiful image. Nicely Thank done. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I can't really see. You good? So, yeah, I just have to zoom in a little bit. Okay. So, the importance of improving water quality. Most of the human body is comprised of water. So the quality of drinking water is important to our health and well-being. We use water da daily throughout um, our homes for cooking, cleaning, bathing, laundry, and a host of other purposes. Water is critical to most items we purchase and consume in one way or another. So up to 60% of the human body is water. And here on the side is just a demonstration of like an, an adult male, uh, adult female, a child, and an infant, and how much water um, their bodies consume. Um, the general water intake from beverages and foods that meet people's needs are about 15.5 cups of water, which is 125 ounces each, um, each daily for men to intake. Um, 11.5 cups, which is 91 ounces daily for women to intake, and about 20% of water intake comes from food, and the rest um, is dependent on drinking water. And women have a lower percentage because we naturally store more fatty tissues. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So water serves as several um, essential functions to keep us all going, such as, let me just zoom in. So it is a vital um, nutrient to the life of every cell, and it acts first as a building material. It regulates our internal body temperature by sweating and respiration. Um, the carbohydrates and proteins that our body used, bodies use as food for um, metabolized and transported by um, water in our bloodstreams. And it assists in flushing water, mainly through um, urination, acts as a shock observer for brain, spinal cord, and um, fetus. It forms saliva and it lubricates joints. Next. Okay, I was just writing. Go ahead. Okay, so where does our water come from? So the United States water. Um, Use comes from the nation's rivers, lakes, reserves, and underground um, aquifers. Um, these bodies of water supply um, the water that serve the needs of every human and the world's um, ecological, ecological systems. Um, for most Americans, the water then flows from intake points to a treatment plant, a storage tank, and then to our houses through various pipe systems. And to the right, you can see um, obviously the United States of America and certain places where it's more, um, where certain places have more use of water than others. Okay. Most of those are agricultural? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so how water pollution impacts water quality. Um, the main problem caused by water pollution is the effect it has on the aquatic life. Aquatic life. Aquatic life, sorry. That's so dead fish, birds, dolphins, and many other animals often wind up on beaches, killed by pollutants in their habitat. Um, these chemicals would travel through the runoff water and end up contaminating our soil. And to the right is just a demonstration of how um, it can contaminate. So versus the healthier side and then the contamination side. 
That's very dramatic. <laughs> okay. So nutrient pollution of groundwater and drinking water. Let me just zoom in. So um, preventing water pollution and conserving water are important to ensure a continuing abundance of water that is safe to use for ourselves and future generations. Um, water pollution is any human-caused contamination of water that produces, reduces its um, usefulness to humans and other organisms in nature. Um, nutrient um, pollution can affect vital groundwater and drinking waters, water surfaces. So surface water provides drinking water to about 170 million people in the United States. And some of these waters are impaired um, or affected by excessive amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus. phosphorus? Sorry. Um, groundwater is water that is soaked into the soil um, and into the water table, about, and about 90 million people rely on this drinking water as a drinking water source. Um, and this water works its way through the soil, and it can also pick up nitrogen and phosphorus and transport them into the water table. So um, this polluted water can reach public drinking water systems and private wells that um, will cause serious public health threats. <clears throat> so this is a way, well, one of the ways that the U.S. has developed like some strict rules or laws um, to help the clean water system in the United States. So it's called the Clean Water Act, CWA, um, and it was enacted in 1948 and, and was referred to as the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, and it was reorganized and expanded in 1972, the Water Pollution Control um, wait, hold on, sorry. So this act establishes in, um, the structure of regulating discharges of pollutants into the water of the U.S. and regulating quality um, standards for surface waters. Um, so under C CWA and the Envi Environmental Protection Agency, um, they implemented pollution control programs such as setting wastewater standards for um, industry. Um, and the EPA has also developed national water quality um, standard, wait, national water quality criteria recommendations for pollutants in surface waters. And the CWA made it um, unlawful to, dis to discharge any pollutant from a point source um, and to navigate, 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 sorry, navigable, not navigatable. Oh my goodness. Waters. Um, useless, a permit was obtained until a permit was obtained. So they couldn't like um, discharge any of their pollutants into the rivers or whatever the case may be without having a, a permit. Um, so, and this goes for industrial, um, uh, municipal, and other facilities uh, must, like I just said, obtain permits if they wanted to discharge um, their pollutants into surface water. <laughs> And this is just a demonstration. So on the left is a picture of a wastewater treatment plant. And on the right is um, a picture of an industrial waste being discharged into a river. So solutions for improving our water quality. Um, and just in the background, those are just like scientists and stuff testing the waters and rivers and stuff. And up on top is um, a picture of a infrastructure, a water, a wastewater infrastructure. But some of the ways for improving our water quality would be increased monitoring and notification. Um, and this will, this will allow a better understanding of the health of surface waters and track down specific causes of Exceedies, ex, ex, uh, exceedancy, sorry. It will also enable regulators to inform the public with more timely and accurate information. Um, investment in wastewater infrastructure is needed to ensure um, the lasting protection of water quality um, and, a, and also better quality policies are needed to improve quality of treatment and overall water management. And also some other ways are to control farm contaminants by applying 
um, mitigation um, tools, plant trees on hills near, near streams to reduce land run runoff, um, remove or migrate possible limiting factors, um, which will pre prevent natural recovery of the area in a short and long term. Um, for example, point source discharges or farm affluent. <clears throat> also manage stock more efficiently, for example, by fencing off streams and waterways to reduce direct water contamination. Um, take care when applying fertilizer and <clears throat> pesticides. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, be aware of water table depth and avoid overusing water in dry seasons. Um, <clears throat> retire land from unsuitable uses or change land uses, for example, um, pasture to forest, <clears throat> excuse me, and careful planning of urban growth and subdivision so that <clears throat> they can have a minimal impact on neighboring waterways and continue control or removal of invasive um, species or pests. And those are pictures on the side of different farms and stuff, a guy um, spraying pesticides and stuff over the crops. Angela, of all of those, which do you think is the most doable and would have the most impact of these nine? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Maybe. And everybody else, you can take the same time to think about what you think would be the most, most critical one and then highlight that in your notes. You may or may not agree with her. Um, maybe number three. All of them are pretty. All of them are important them. and all of them are worthy of implementation. I'm just saying, what do you yeah. think is the most I think important number three. number three? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, again, everybody else is supposed to make their own selection on this. Do you need it up for a few minutes? Um, what was your question, Professor? That which one is like the most doable or out of all of them? Like what would be more? What do you think of these nine is the most critical in terms and the easiest to do? I.e. easiest to do and critical is going to have the greatest impact. It's more likely to be done. I mean, we can have a very, very long wish list of things, and I, I agree with all of them, but what's going to be most likely and, and most impactful? <clears throat> okay. Everybody have something? Take that as yes. And so Water is Life, thanks for tuning in, and um, Cajun that's where it's. And then the next two slides are just the uh, um, citations. Right. Yes, yeah. you have to have that. That that looks like fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are my article citations and then my picture citations. Okay, you have some nice sources. Oh, mm -hmm. glad that you put in photo citations. A lot of people forgot. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kajla. You're welcome. All right. Next up, who's next up here? Uh, it's 429. Robert, you good to go? Robert? Okay, I'll pull you up. You're doing improving air quality, so you can mark down improving air quality for Robert.
Oh, I love that. That's cute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've, I've, the whole... Well, no, the whole thing about us not having access to animations or videos or URLs is not helpful. But I'm glad you thought of it. Yeah, me too. Maybe they'll fi figure out a way around it in the future. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to leave this on for a moment for people to take notes if they need to. And then at the bottom, you note that this has to be a worldwide effort because air goes everywhere. Well, every, everybody can do something just because everyone isn't doing something. Everybody can help somewhat. It's just that if everyone doesn't tackle it. It's not going to happen as quickly. Um, Robert, do you want me to go to the next slide? I have stuck on this one. Oh, okay. No, that's fine. Just, just tell me when you're ready. Okay, go ahead. The next one. Okay. All right. Oh, wow. Yeah, definitely. Okay.
So given the current environment with COVID-19, if you, if you have bad air in your house, you're more susceptible basically to, to great, greater effects from it. Yeah. What do you think of the idea of New York City banning all vehicles? So if they just had like transportive trucks for getting materials in and out and everything, if they just banned all, all, all uh, other vehicles, it should be fine. Well, other cities around the world have done it. from Anna I I don't know I I I think it's doable I think it would be a good idea like I don't know if it would be politically feasible for them I think that's going to be the limiting factor, not that it can't be done. Okay, so now what can we do? Would you prefer an appliance, a light bulb that is energy star efficient, even if it costs more money? That's a 
that's fair. Depends on how much more efficient, huh? Yeah. Okay. 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 Next. Okay. So India, Australia, China, parts of China. Okay. So why do you think that those particular countries made those decisions? Is that something um, intrinsic to their cultures or what? Uh-huh. So they were leaders in terms of doing it early and early in the evolution of the uh, environmental movement then. Okay. Okay.
So you have mold down in both serious and irritation. So different types of molds or different levels of it or what? Thank you. Okay, next is Maribel, you there? Maribel? Maribel? There. Yeah. Okay, you ready to go? Mm hmm. Okay, let me get this up for you. Okay. This one. Continue. Be right back. I have to get a dog. I think okay. we're just tired. <laughs> okay. Uh, so introduce yourself and your topic. Um, so my topic was vegan options. Okay. You want to tell them why you picked that? Um, it just interests me. I was vegan for a little bit. And the whole thing is just really interesting on how it works and how it affects our life. Okay. Hopefully positively, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, what is veganism? So, by definition, it's a way of living which seeks to exclude as far as possible and practical all forms of exploitation or cruelty or use of animals for food and clothing. Um, so, it's a plant-based diet. And in this diet, you can't use any animal products or animal byproducts. And this includes soaps and makeups and fabrics and anything that was tested on animals. Um, also byproducts which is including food and eggs and things like that and leather so no leather um, purses or shoes yeah. like nothing that comes from animals okay um, so how can it benefit you um, because you're taking in a much lower amount of calories it helps you lose weight it reduces um, the risk of heart disease I'm sorry. Uh, so with reduce um, the risk of heart disease, it lowers the cholesterol levels and 75%, there's a 75% risk, lower risk of developing high blood pressure when you're already vegan. Um, and there's a 42% lower risk of dying from heart disease. There is also a 15% lower chance of getting cancers like such as colon cancer and being vegan pro protects against getting breast cancer. Um, whereas like uh, dairy products and other and meats and such are known to raise the risk of prostate cancer. Um, you can manage your diabetes um, by lowering A1C levels by being vegan and it reduces pain from arthritis. And there's been like many, many um, 
like researches where uh, joint swelling and arthritis and like everything else has a, there's greater improvement in symptoms and joint swelling in the morning and night from people who choose to be vegan. You can go to the next one. Thank you. Um, so for the world, it's beneficial because it combats hunger. 70% of the grain grown in U.S. is used to feed livestock, whereas it could be used to feed the hungry children. And 83% of farmland is set aside to raise animals rather than to grow crops. Um, so 700 million tons of food could be used to feed people a year, whereas they're used to feed animals and other and other things that help the animal industry. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so eventually we're going to have too many people in the world that are relying on food sources, whereas if we went vegan, it wouldn't be as much of an issue and it wouldn't be something to worry about in the future. So you can conserve water by... Um, I'm sorry, hundreds of millions of people around the world don't have access to clean water. And many people struggle with periodic water scarcity, which becomes, which can come through drought and mismanagement of water sources. But also livestock is the number one user of fresh water in the world. And they're the number one water polluters. And it takes 100 to 200 times more water to raise a pound of beef than, a plant, than to raise plant food and, and anything else that grows out of the ground. Um, so if relatively speaking, you know, like in theory, being vegan would do all these things like clean soil and everything, but that would include everyone in the world doing it. So it's not realistic, but if a large portion of the population decided to do it, it would really make a drastic difference with like you would see changes within a week. Um, it would clean the soil. It, sorry. Do you think it's, I'm sorry. Do you think it's possible for people to be vegan, like, sporadically, but then go back um, to a regular diet, or no? Yes, but there, that's not the point of it, I feel. The point is for animal rights and for, you know, to, I guess, to use what comes from the earth rather than to kill what's on it. Okay. What about the idea? In my opinion, I don't feel like it's... I'm sorry. Okay. What about the idea of children because they have very, very high protein needs and other needs that can easily be filled with a pure vegan diet? Yeah. I, mean, I feel like yeah, it could okay. be... Vegan diets are sufficient. And there's so many different... Especially now when you have, like, um, tablets and, like, you know, different vitamins that you could take. Okay. So you have different resources now that we didn't have then. Okay. That could definitely make it a lot easier to do. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I was on soil. Okay, sorry. Oh, so no. livestock erodes and weaken soil, and by raising livestock, it leads to de deforestation, which uh -huh. clears large large areas of land that provides nutrients to the soils, like trees and all the other crops. So uh -huh. by taking down, like. By deforestation, you were killing the earth and you're just ruining the soil. And it's just all, it just all goes downhill. Um, every year, the world loses like the size of Panama due to deforestation. And it's just accelerating climate change at a rapid rate. Um, so by going vegan, you could also reduce energy consumption because raising livestock uses a lot of energy and it takes a lot of time to raise animals. They consume a lot of food and the land that they're on could have been could be repurposed. Also, you have to keep in mind like shipping and refrigerating all the products that come from animals also takes a lot of time and energy, which could be placed somewhere else in order to grow food rather than to just drive it around. Um, so. It, ta it also takes a long time, which then you have to think of like energy costs, like lights and running the machines that take care of all of these processes. And plant-based proteins can be raised with eight times less energy costs, which is a big difference. 
Um, and I guess, so it purifies the air because livestock causes a lot of air pollution more than cars, buses, planes, and boats, and like all the transportation in the world combined. Um, whereas plants, if you keep growing plants, they clean the air and they take carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen, which is what we need. And they also take out all the impurities from the air. Um, I wrote ethical all in caps because that's more of a personal, you know, like feeling towards it. I feel like it's a more ethical way to live, but I, I'm also not vegan right now. So I don't, you know, I'm not really, I guess, supporting it, but I still believe that it's a way to better the earth and better the lives of animals. Why did you decide not to be vegan? I moved away to college in Rhode Island and it was just easier to not stick to that. I was vegetarian even after that, but it still was really hard to stick with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. That was it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, thank you. So there's a lot of, you know, cons to being vegan. Like in a diet, you need protein. You have to find a lot of sources, new sources is for things that are essential to your body like protein but that can come from also come from plants like tofu and soy and um like other things that include say satan i think it's been satan which comes from gluten and you can find that in chickpeas and lentils also you're missing b12 and which can if you lack a lot of it, it can make you feel tired and weak so getting enough b12 is really important um, it's not found in plants, but it could be, uh, found in fortified cereals and fortified rice and like soy drinks. Um, also a big thing that people do is they take supplements, um, when they're vegan, but it's really hard and you have to be careful because the coating of a lot of things is made out of gelatin and you have to be sure not to use animal products. You have to watch what you eat in every aspect of your life. Um, like essential fatty acids, you have to, you, if you have a lack of them, it leads to, um, it could cause brain issues. So it's important to have all of these things for just for your body. Like lack of fatty acids causes, um, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it affects your brain health and it's important to uh, keep it healthy because cognitive impairment and depression are very common with a lack of these essential acids. Um, and then iron, also you need in vitamin D, but that could be, you know, vitamin D could just sit in the sun for 10, 15 minutes or have like a glass of orange juice. Um, also people who are vegan have a 20% higher rate of stroke, of getting a stroke than meat eaters do. But, and they can also have hair loss and mood swings or issues, but I I feel like that's not as big of a risk that you're taking as you are when you're eating meat because there's such higher risks with heart issues rather than just strokes. Why do you think there's a higher rate of strokes? Did you see any um, information on that? I didn't read too much into that. Okay. But I, that was one of the few like downsides to being vegan that I found. Downside, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, or are you ready? I'm sorry. Yeah, next slide. <sighs> these are just some stats. Um, so these are just the ages of the animals on, before they're slaughtered and how long they live, approximately. Like, Dairy cows only live to about four years before they're slaughtered for meat. And sometimes they're not even slaughtered for meat. Their meat is used to like feed other animals. Uh, and like, um, so on the left side, the graph, the red, yellow, blue ones, it's like, it's describing how much um, emissions and land use and water use comes from the different types of milk that you choose to use. As, like, as you can see, dairy milk is like two or three times more pollutant than the other ones and uses way more energy and land and it ruins the air 
way more than any of the other ones do. Um, you can go to the next slide. Oh, I was reading it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Oh, okay. You have two different ways. So, of all of those forms of milk, what's your favorite? Um, I actually don't really use milk. I use almond milk and like almond creamer for my coffee. Otherwise, I don't really use milk. So, okay. for me, me i guess almond milk okay but everyone else in my house uses a lot of dairy milk oh well dairy milk's high in protein the other ones pretty much aren't other than maybe soy yeah but you can get protein in other sources yeah it's an yeah. easy, easy relatively cheap one to use dairy milk but you know each yeah. thing. okay um so this is just another picture and it just has some like that's on, um, like, the cholesterol levels of people and different health benefits or um, bad things that come with being vegan, but it's mostly good things. And how, like, the only 21% of the world is considered vegetarian but not vegan, I still think that's a pretty big number. That's a one over a fifth of the population. It's hard to read chart. Yeah, I'm sorry. It looks really yeah, small that, here. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So if twenty one point nine percent of the world of world's considered vegetarian, how many how many percentage worldwide is vegan then like four percent um well in the u.s six percent of the world is vegan okay. of our sorry of our country is vegan which is actually a 500 percent increase from 2014 when it was only one percent yeah it's increasing i've also had people that I mean, know yeah. that were vegan that then couldn't couldn't maintain it a long period of time they would do it for a while and they couldn't do it anymore yeah, I had a friend whose mom was vegan for 40 years, and then one day she just stopped. Just, like, by personal choice. Uh, well, it should be. <laughs> yeah. It's just after 40 years, you know, to just stop is kind of crazy to see. Well, you have different different opinions at different points of time and different needs at different points in time in your life. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, oh, these are just some yeah, comebacks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then yeah, there's I a didn't... couple more, but I guess they didn't make it on here. Okay. Um, um, well, let's so, see. Oh, yeah. you have your citations there. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have any spare ribs. That is seriously <laughs> cute. And, pig, and piglets are absolutely adorable. Oh, um, yeah. Grown up pigs, cute. not so much. They can be quite difficult. <laughs> but piglets are cute. I agree with that. And then those are just for. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. Let's see who's up. Thank you. Devin, you there? Do you have mic access? Devin, do you have mic access? No, you don't have mic access. Uh, let's see, where are we at on this? Yours is composting. I can handle that for you. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. Composting and soil improvement. Yes. <sighs> Huh. 
Yeah, nice shot. You guys have good artistic choices. So this is Devin's one. She doesn't have mic access, so I'll wing it here for her. You see the very lush grasses here. You will note that these look to be native grasses. They're allowed to grow their full height, which could easily be exceeding 12 inches, unlike long grasses, which ideally would be at about three inches. <clears throat> so what is composting? It's a process, uh, it's actually a natural process of organic matter decomposition. If you leave plant material in, in an uh, open area for long enough, eventually it will self-compost without you doing anything at all. The whole point of composting is to speed up that process of what would be natural decomposition by bacteria, fungi, and other organisms. So uh, things that you'd normally throw away, instead of throwing it in the garbage can and adding to the landfills, you can go ahead and use a composting bin. Usually composting bins are roughly three, three by three feet or five by five feet or somewhere in between. And these can decompose uh, quite effectively and later your compost can be screened and added to the soil or used unscreened depending on your preference. Uh, composting not only reduces the amount of waste, it also creates a very, very nice organic matter uh, within the soil profile. So you can see on the lower right, that she has some carrot pieces and some carrot peelings and potato peelings. And all of these are excellent in terms of adding to a compost pile. Uh, when you add them, you have to intermix them with non-fleshy material such as dried leaves or newspaper or whatever uh, you have that has, has a higher carbon source so it can act more effectively. And you see a little, uh, no, maybe not. Okay, so here's some of your benefits of using composting. Uh, when you add compost to soil, it re helps it retain more water, which means that the plants don't dry out as easily. So if all of a sudden we have a, a droughty period during the summer or during the winter, those plants can, can, uh, can continue to grow and survive. Uh, reduce the soil erosion uh, because um, it's it helps increase the aggreg aggregation within the soil profile with minerals and other substances there. Uh, it helps carbon sequ uh, sequestr sequestering. Um, and basically that's what happens in the top three feet for the most part of your soil where rather than the carbon going into the air as excess carbon dioxide and changing the climate profile or weather in the area, it helps hold that carbon in uh, better. <clears throat> it's going to reduce your landfill waste. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's a critical issue in terms of we have only so many landfills and they're rapidly filling up. Within the next 20 years or so, most of them will be full and they, in the U.S. anyhow, and they'll have to start looking for new places to install those uh, landfills. And I don't know anybody who would volunteer to have one next door to them. Uh, so reduces the need for synthetic fertilizers. Compost is not a fertilizer. It does have nutrient value in terms of the organic matter helps hold nutrients and make them more readily available to plants. So uh, here we go. So why is it important? And on the right side, you can see what appears to be about a three by three foot car, uh, compost bin. This is one that somebody can easily manufacture from leftover pallets from shipping. And you basically put, put these up. And the point of the compost bin is to allow for sufficient air and water balance within the pile so that rather than the pile going anaerobic, it becomes an aerobic pile and has high quality compost. Anaerobic form compost is usually of lower quality and has a bad odor. Aerobically formed compost, it really doesn't have a, a significant odor at all other than smelling like nice earth. Uh, <clears throat> so why is it important? Uh, it would take, okay, if everyone in the U.S. composted just their food waste, not including their yard waste as well, it would have the same effect as taking uh, nearly 8 million cars off the road. So again, it doesn't, 
It does provide some nutrients, but that's not the reason for using compost. The reason for using compost is for the organic matter that it adds and that creating a greater nutrient availability. Okay, so here's soil improvements. So you can see on this, uh, this section that they're, what are they doing here? I'm not sure what they're doing there. It looks like they're digging holes. Okay, if they're digging holes at that level and at that size, that's probably they're putting in a nursery and everything. So here are some techniques uh, for using uh, compost and improving the soil. So here you have shallow roots. This would uh, example if you have a long grass and you cut it below three inches. You have very shallow roots. You often have compacted soil along with that too short long grass. You would also be having increased weed pressure. When you aerate, what they're showing here is a core aeration process where you go ahead and basically cut holes, uh, tube-like, and varies, varies in um, diameter, but usually fairly small diameter tubes within the soil. And by doing that, you've allowed for air and water to mix more thoroughly, which allows for a deeper root profile. In the third, third uh, image here, you can see how the roots have basically taken off, especially in that area where those plugs had come out. And then finally, you'll end up having these roots spreading evenly and more seeds germinating more readily. Often when you do this, you overseed at the same time that you're a core aerating, so you have a higher population of grass, hence you have less problems with weeds as well. So, grouting, Jason, probably Okay, so you have grouting, you have soil reinforcement, um, you can do soil reinforcement by geoengineering methods. Uh, this is often something where you use a geotextile and everything. They do it for, for uh, stormwater management along waterways. Vertical drains to consolidate soft ground and higher wa water content. Uh, some of these vertical drains are basically pits that they have that they fill with gravel. And then you have a stabilization where you're altering some of the soil's properties in order to create a better overall soil environment. The soil itself is actually an ecosystem into and of itself. So soil improvement can be useful for, and now we have a new picture down here. The Leaning Tower of Pizza was built on an unstable base, and for that reason, it's slowly sinking and it's thinking at an uneven angle. It's basically stabilized uh, with engineering methods, but it was, they leave it leaning because it's a huge tourist attraction, not that they can fix it from leaning. Okay, why compost? So compost as well as soil improvement provides so many benefits. Soil improvement creates a foundation for plants to grow. Um, it's in construction. Oh, each, each type of soil has different human uses for it. Some soils are ideal for, use, uh, for putting be building, materi uh, building materials, buildings up because it's very, very stable. It's not moving much. Other soils are better are used for agriculture, ones which have high fertility levels, high organic matter levels, uh, or tend to be softer. Um, Composting tends to keep the soil full of nutrients that it needs to grow, as well as keeping the soil conditioned. Uh, so you're reducing the amount of household waste. Compost bins are not that, that difficult to manage. Basically go out once or twice a week and turn, turn the compost and it aerates it. And then those are the references. Any questions? Composting, any questions? We good? You need me to go back through any of it? I went through pretty fast. Devin, you want to add okay. anything? No? Yes? Devin? Yeah. Chat box? Okay. All right, we're good then. Now, let me put this on.
All right. Matthew, you there? <laughs> Matthew? It's here without looking. Oops. Matthew? Oops. Oh, you have no mic either. Oh, why well, didn't mean for you to have to do that? Sorry. All right. Matthew also doesn't have it. So, I guess I will be doing this one. Designing herb gardens. All right, Matthew, as we go along, if you have anything to add, please put it in the chat box for everyone. And we'll be speaking on designing herb gardens. So I look in the chat box periodically to see if Matt has anything additional he wants to mention. Oh, that's pretty. Okay. So this is Designing an Herb Garden. And while I'm presenting, this is Matt Rubino's work. So if you'd write that down for your records, Designing an Herb Garden. Ready? I'll take this, yes. Okay, so let's start looking at this. So we have herb gardens, our outdoor areas specifically for the growth of herbs. I would like to add, do note that I haven't read all these yet. Herb gardens can also be indoors. Uh, a kitchen herb garden is actually one of the first things that a lot of people start their gardening with. Not all herbs do well inside, but a lot of them do. So some examples that he has of herbs are basil, rosemary, thyme, sage, dill, and lavender. Uh, and then he has in the pot that, that's showing there, he has cilantro, again, basil, peppermint, which is an excellent one and not easily adapted to an herb garden, dill, which is a very tall one, Usually there are miniature varieties, some parsley and some chives, all of which sound fairly familiar with uh, to many of you. These are not necessarily primarily medicinal. These are, are primary culinary herbs with possibly some medicinal uses. So you can either use big areas in the lawn. Um, at one point in time, I had a thyme lawn for a while. Uh, I had to get rid of it because I'm allergic to bees and they uh, they loved it. So uh, so even as simple as a few pots can be designated for herbs. So it doesn't have to be where you're going wholesale and uh, basically taking out all of your yard and replacing it with herbs. You can do just one pot. You can do two pots. You can do a two or three foot area. So it's up to you what you want to use for it. So there are substantial advantages to it. Uh, fresh herbs have a greater fla uh, flavor profile, a wider fla flavor profile than you would have with, uh, with dried herbs, which is what most people use in cooking. And the idea is that when you grow your own herbs, you know that you grew them and you know, know that you did not apply pesticides or you did not apply pesticides irresponsibly, which isn't necessarily the case if you buy them from somebody else. Also, the herbs tend to keep away mosquitoes and other pests. If you've got problems with uh, deer, rabbits, groundhogs, herbs tend to be one uh, plants that they usually avoid or use less of. And in the long run, growing your own fresh herbs can save you a lot of money. Oh, er here's herbal medicine. <clears throat> So plants, uh, other than uses for food, plants have been used historically for uh, medicinal purposes. They actually have a very strong medicinal profile. Uh, so it's a natural way to try to eat, uh, eat better, feel better, stay, stay healthier, which is very important for all of us, especially now. And uh, herbal medicine has been studied for a very long point, uh, long time. Uh, 
it's been documented to be effect effective. Do know that any kind of herbal use, um, you need to be aware of, of the quantity that you're using and that you don't have an easy way of just getting a certain amount of active ingredient that you need. So err on the side of caution, use less rather than more in most cases. And this is Matt's opinion here. I believe herbal medicine should be tried before prescription drugs. I think that's reasonable. And always talk to a doctor about what is needed. And note that many herbal supplements can work. In general, they're not nearly as dangerous as prescription drugs. But also keep in mind the idea that herbals, because they have medicinal purposes, can also be abused and can also interact with other things that you're taking. So don't assume that you can just take any herbal out there. Do your appropriate research and make sure that it's not conflicting with anything that you are taking or using or any health conditions you have. I will tell you that. So here's how to make your herb garden. <clears throat> so it's very, very simple. You start out with the basics like you would for any 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 plant. Use good soil or if you're growing it indoors, use good uh, good media, a peat, good peat-based media. Outdoors, uh, if you're planting in-ground, soil's fine. Um, you can use cuttings or small propagules of of the herb plants or you can grow them from seed some of them are easier than others uh, you use a water source uh, a readily available water source uh, if you have it far away from your home and you have a large property it's a good idea to have a hose that will stretch that far or be willing to carry buckets out for it you need nutrient solutions although be careful with that because a lot of herbs will have less of less of a medicinal value, less flavor if you use too much nitrogen uh, or too much fertilizer in general. Some of them actually prefer to be grown with less rather than more. You need gardening tools and you need some space. Then you need to designate a portion of your backyard or, or wherever you're putting it or the pots and on a deck or patio. Uh, you need to get full sunshine for at least 68 hours every day. And you want to make sure that you have enough space for the plant at its mature size. And this should be the general rule of thumb for any planting that you do. Do you have room for it at whatever its mature size is? Don't look at what it currently is. Look at what its potential is. That way you won't have to pull it out later. So here's some famous herb gardens. Oh, that's cute. Okay, this is Belly Malo Cooking School in Ireland. It has a well-known herb garden that has over 70 herbs. So these would be ones, since it's a cooking school, that are focused on culinary use rather than on uh, medicinal use. There are also medicinal herb gardens. This is a very, very formal herb, uh, herb garden design where you have, have distinct areas for each type of shrub and you have them lined with boxwood or some other herbal. Uh, boxwood's not herbal, but some sort of hedge type. This is the herb garden in Chesterfield. Here you can see how it's lined. These are very, very tightly maintained. Uh, so it started in 1983. They now have four of these. Again, this is a very, very formal presentation. You can see they have a lot of hardscape in here rather than a lot of soil in here. That's so that you can walk around here without uh, having muddy shoes, I guess. <laughs> Uh, this is a somewhat less formal garden than the prior to. This is a Mount Grace uh, Priory. These have had medieval uh, herb gardens and they were restored. Um, the drawing on the on the drawing on the left shows where the where you have the uh, flowering mead. That would be where the herb garden was. And here you can see they have. Again, a stone walkway, but less formality here. This was primarily used for both uh, med medicinal and culinary use. And that's all I have, Matt. Is that all there is? Matt, you there? Do you want to add anything, Matt? Yes, no, maybe. That's good. Okay. All right, so we did that one. So let's see who's next on the list.
Kelly, are you there? Kelly? Yes, I'm here. Can you go next? Yeah. Did food gardening, right? Yeah. Did I put it? Indoor food gardening? Yes. <clears throat> When you're ready. Okay. So my topic was indoor food gardening, and that's just a picture of an example. It's a hydroponic unit. Yes. Yeah. Okay, you can go to the next one. And that's lettuce. Oh, I thought it was cabbage. No, that's lettuce. They don't do cabbage in there. Okay, so one of the benefits of doing your own indoor food gardening is pesticide-free fruit and vegetables. So you know personally what's going into producing the plant or vegetable. Um, conventional farming, they use many pesticides and syn synthetic fertilizers. And commercial farming deposits harmful chemicals into water and soil. So by growing your own food, it will nourish your soil and you will use safe and natural types of fertilizers. And yeah, next one. Okay, I'm writing. Another benefit, it saves money. So Indoor growing allows you to grow your plants 365 days a year, making it possible to grow a lot of types of food in all climates. You can produce what you want to eat and what you need, and one packet of seeds can supply more food for a smaller price than weekly spending to buy produce from the grocery store. And these are just photos of uh, things being grown like inside. And how it like kind of is set up. The little girl on the left, would that have been you when you were little? No. Um, well, we didn't do much indoor gardening, but I did have a garden outside. My grandpa was really into gardening and stuff. So, yeah, I would do that with him. So, you got to eat peas off the vine and tomatoes off the vine? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I loved picking the tomatoes and I think we did eggplant and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was fun. Okay. So the quality is better. The fruits and vegetables sold in stores have been adapted for commercial farming. And so growing at home makes them completely clean and fresh, depending on if you grow them right. And it takes a long time to ship food from, uh, from farms to the store, where at home it's right from the garden to your table. And growing indoors also stops the quality of your food being affected by local pests. Because you have the control. And yeah, those are more photos. It's kind of hard to find like good photos. Um, but yeah, I just put those. That is different, whatever. What they did on the lower left. Yeah, I was going to, yeah. Um, yeah. So they basically cut down an old Pepsi bottle or something and used it as a gross chamber. This is what it looked like they did. Yes? Yeah, yeah, that looks exactly like it. Okay, and then on the right, they got to a more expensive version of that. Yeah. Do you think it's necessarily any better? Um, It might maybe be a little better, but I think on the, the lower left, that still works too. Okay. But I, I don't know 100%. <laughs> Um, so buying from your local plant stores or starting your own seedlings allows you to select from different varieties of plants and, um, oh wait, that picture is blocking what it says, but, um, there are a hundred varieties based on flavor, shape, and color, and the photo shows, um, options of what you could grow. 
I'm sure there's more, but those are like the main um, okay. choices. But, uh, hold on a minute. I'm going to write a few of these, John. Okay. First of all, that is not even DR. Look at that water. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, climate change. Um, carbon emissions, they will be lowered because most food and grocery stores are not grown locally and they have to be shipped hundreds of miles. Uh, it helps reduce the amount of fossil fuels used that are as a direct result of importing foods from commercial farmers and reducing waste used to pa uh, package the produce. So you're all in all like saving, and reducing and recycling. If you choose to do indoor food gardening. Um, okay, so it reduces the danger of contamination. So growing and harvesting food from your backyard garden makes it so you know where the food came from, which is nice and assuring. And the U.S. federal government estimates that 48 million people get sick from food or illnesses each year. So 128,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 die. Um, e. coli, salmonella, and listeria are the most common of the outbreaks. And there's no need to worry, um, usually when you grow your own salad vegetables. What do you think would be the most common, uh, commonly uh, affected, contaminated uh, produce? Um, like, what do you mean? Like, which one have you heard the most recalls on or the most posts oh, about uh, don't eat lettuce. this? Which? Lettuce? Like, um, what is it, yeah. romaine lettuce, is it? Yeah, lettuce is definitely up there. Um, that's what, yeah. Um, lettuce, yeah. What are the other ones? I, I think I've only known lettuce. It's not tomatoes, right? I haven't. Yeah, tomatoes usually don't have that much of an issue. They have have a high acid content. It tends to deter it. Yeah. Okay. So less food waste. Um, grocery stores are forced to buy more produce than is needed at a time, which is not good. Waste. Um, long shipping time means. Produce doesn't stay fresh nearly as long as causing more food to be wasted. And when you're growing at home, you can pick only what is needed at that specific time. So there's a lot less waste going on. And yeah. Those are just some more pictures of setups of what an indoor garden can look like. Looking at the plants on your left, what mm -hmm. is your opinion on the ones in the little square pots, the tall ones? I'm not really sure what's being grown there, but um, it looks nice and fresh and it's only in that like little container. So I don't know, it looks good. I'm not really sure. Actually, it's not getting enough light. Oh, you meant to like that. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 It's a light, too light of a green and too long of an inner node distance. Right. Yeah. So if you ever wanted to do an indoor, you'd have to do a lot, probably more research on what they need. And 
Yeah. yeah, some some plants tolerate it better than others, but in any case, the getting sufficient light and length of day length is very important if you're growing indoors. Okay, what about the one on the right? That looks like it's getting enough light. Right, but and you can see awesome. those bars above where, above where the plants are. Those are, are fluorescent or LED or whatever they are, <laughs> lights to add supplemental lighting. And one of the things that they have to watch is they have to have the lights X number of inches above the plants, usually no closer than three inches and not any further away than six to eight inches. But it varies by the plant in terms of what they're trying to do in the growth stage it's in. Right. Um, I'm assuming, I would guess, that the sun is a better light source than the, the lights. Is that right? The, the sun is an ideal light source for plants, yes. It's, you have it measured in a number yeah. of different different uh, different units. The most common one that general consumers know about is called foot candles. And outdoor light is about ten thousand foot candles. Normal indoor lights around one thousand foot candles. So there's a huge difference. And to a certain extent, you have to make up the difference, preferably by having a lot of uh, a lot of access to your stronger lights, like your western exposures. Or, and or supplementing and the other <coughs> other alternative is sort of indoor outdoor where you move them outdoors for part oh, of the day and then bring them in at night okay go ahead so another benefit is your health it encourages families to regularly include um, fruits and vegetables in their diet um, they are fruits and vegetables are packed with many vitamins and minerals and Avoiding pesticides commonly used in plants can lower your exposure to certain cancers. So that's very good. Okay. Do you think, based on your experience, that a vegetarian, a vegan, is more likely to have an indoor garden than someone who's not? I would believe so, yeah. I would think so. Okay. If that's the last slide. Oh. Um, my sources are on a Google or on a document. So can uh, I? Sure yes, I yes. Little... You can send me the document. Yes, as an add-in. But everybody on any of these, since you didn't write it, write it from your head or anything, you should all have some form of citations or references at the end. So yes, you can send me the reference document. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. All right. We good then, Kelly? Awesome. Yep. Okay. Rachel, you there somewhere? Rachel, oops. Let me see if she's there. Chat. Shrink chat. Rachel. Rachel, you ready? Down here. Rachel? Rachel? May have stepped out for a moment. Rachel, you there? Rachel, okay, well, maybe, what time do we have? One twenty. Okay, well, if she's not there, we'll go ahead and we'll move on to what I have scheduled next. Have vegan, hold on, I have to find my notes here. I did have that. Not there, there. There it is. I have Dane. Are you able to present? Dane? Dane? You there? Dane presented last class. Oh, did he? For, for the barley? Thank you for telling me that. Uh, I didn't write that down. Jessica, what about you? Jessica? Jessica? Hey, there, but not there. Okay. Rachel, you there? See yeah, if she's in chat. 
No, I can't grab it. Give me a moment. <sighs> Chat box. No, no. There we are. Okay, Jessica, hello. Your mic doesn't work again. Okay, Jessica's doesn't work. Okay, so she's there, but hers isn't working. So I guess I'm presenting this one too. Okay, hang in there. Okay. Yeah, we did that one. Okay, that's over. So. Okay. Let me put this. Carrot. See who else. Stop for a minute. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm presenting for Jessica. Again, I have not read this yet, so please bear with me. Again, you're taking notes for this. This would go into your plant projects analysis. All right, so we're starting out with carrot. The a carrot is a common vegetable garden plant with lacy, pinnately compound leaves. Each leaflet is finely dissected, and the entire leaf is triangular and outlined. Pretty reasonable. Now, here's the genus and species. So the genus is Dacus. The species is Carata. The variety or naturally occurring type is called Sativus. And this has uh, Latin and Greek origins for the name. And Sativus describes the subspecies, which literally means cultivated in Latin. If it was a fissinelle, that would basically mean that it has medicinal properties. Okay, leaves. So here you see this nice, finely, uh, finely dissected leaves. Okay, I don't know that I agree with that, so I would have to look into that. So here's some shapes and sizes. So you can see that they come in a wide range. The longest of them is called an imperator, and you can see that it forms a long oblong shape pointed at the bottom. The Danvers was basically um, basically developed for uh, for soils that were a little bit a uh, little bit less accommodating, carrots prefer a very loose soil. So if you had a somewhat dense soil, such as one that had more clay content to it, you would want to use a Danvers. Now, if you had a really really rough soil, uh, you could go ahead and use a Chardonnay. Uh, this one tends to uh, be used for processing, such as you would use for your baby carrots. Um, you know, the, quote, baby carrots that you get are actually machined down to that size. Uh, so from an imperator, you can actually get about three or four baby carrots from a single carrot. Your Nantes comes with your blunt chip in cylindrical form. So here you can see rather than the gradual tapering for an imperator, you basically have a tube and then a little point to it. Uh, this one has very, very, very good quality. Uh, there are a number of different Nantes types. And then the very small one here, you have in what you would call your gravelly soil, your clay soil, where you wanted a carrot, you wanted access to a carrot, but your soil wasn't, wasn't suitable for it. So you would grow, grow one of these uh, globe-shaped ones, this particular one is Paris Market. Um, now, they have different variations of each of these, and these are sort of like general classifications uh, where, where a specific initial cultivar was chosen. Okay, here's your flowers. 
Okay, I'd also question whether or not this was a good idea. Okay, center of origin. Okay, so their domesticated form of wild carrot, the Dacus carota, is native to Europe and southwestern Asia, which means that when we came to this country, we brought it with us. They are not native to the U.S. Um, there are wild relatives similar to this that can be found in different places, but even those were, were basically brought into the U.S. Uh, probable origination... Uh, Originating point was Persia or Iraq. I'm sorry, Iran. I get them mixed up. Okay, current distribution. Reports by the USDA Economic Research Service has noted different carrot consumption patterns across regions of the U.S. The West, Central, and Eastern regions of the U.S., they didn't find significant differences between using as fresh, between fresh at home carrot consumption. Now here's some benefits. So they're rich in beta carotene, which can be turned into vitamin A. Um, that most plants don't have access, in fact, I can't think of any that do, have access to vitamin A within them. So the closest you're going to get is something that has beta carotene and the beta carotene your body then processes into vitamin A. So this is an advantage if you're vegan and trying to get sufficient uh, vitamin balance. Vitamin A is transformed in the retina to rhodopsin, which is a purple pigment, and that's what's necessary for night vision. So there's some basis for the idea that when you have, have a poor vision, that you eat an increased number of, of carrots and improves that night vision at least. So studies have shown carrots reduce the risk of lung cancer, breast cancer, and colon cancer. Studies show that diets high in carotenoids are associated with a lower risk of heart disease. From all the above benefits, it's no surprise that Harvard recommended that people eat six carrots a week, and that would make them less likely to suffer stroke than those who ate only one carrot a month or more. That would make sense. Okay, so that's a nice study. I'd like to see that. Okay, here's fun facts. I love fun facts. So, 87% of a carrot is water. Even though it feels very, very solid to us, it's actually a large proportion of it is water. One teaspoon can hold 2,000 carrot seeds. They're very, very small. And one glass of milk contains the same amount of calcium as in nine carrots. So if you need additional calcium and you can't drink milk, carrots are a good option for you. And here's some photos, and she has at the upper left, she shows that there's variation in the color of the carrots. These are be closer to the Imperator type uh, that's very, very long and thin, and what we typically think of as a carrot. So you have orange, purple, red, white, and then again, uh, again uh, a darker color of orange. And then in the center, lower right, uh, lower, she's showing how carrots grow in soil. And when carrots grow, they push down the, root, uh, the tap root, but they also put, pushes back somewhat. So the actual top of the carrot, the top half inch inch usually pushes up above the, above the soil. So you can see how big your carrot is before you harvest it. Then you have your, your stem and your leaves above that. And then she shows a plate of cooked carrots with it looks like chives, I'm thinking. An interesting combination. Okay, and then she has her references here. So, any questions, guys? Oops, back there. Chat, chat, okay, chat. All right, we good? So, everybody did carrot. I have that, and I have to mark about the other one for Dane. Does anybody else have to present? Anybody have any questions? Um, I don't think I presented my vocabulary. All right, who is speaking? I'm Kajla. Kajla. Uh, let me see if I've got it up here. here for you, Nelly. Okay, hold on. Vocabulary. Go back here. I think I sent you the link to Google Slides. Okay, so Rachel, you say that you, Rachel, are you able to present? 
facial are you able to present? You mean, you mean occasionally? Oh, your mic doesn't work either. You have a lot uh -huh. of bad mics in these. Okay, who told me that they needed their vocabulary? I lost track. Keishla. Keishla. Okay, this uh -huh. is your test two PowerPoint. Is that the one you're referring to? Um, yeah. Okay. Those were the four vocabulary. Um, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Dane, get get back here. Sorry, it's not showing me everything. Let Let's continue with this. We'll We'll do casual, and then we'll figure out who else I need to do. Okay. You had barley. Okay. Somebody told me you already went. I didn't think you did. Okay. I'll pull it back up after this. All right. Let me go back to my notes before you start. All right. So, where am I at? Wait, um, can you give me a second? Who, what? All right, you there? Okay, yeah. All right. Okay. All right, let's go. Five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I have to write something now for a minute. It's Hold okay. On. Um, this is from test two, right? Okay, go ahead. This is for you viewing your understanding languages of science. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go for it. So my first word was berry. And a berry is a fleshy fruit or a pulpy in, in, the, in this. How do you say that again? Indehiscent? Indehiscent, dear. Indehiscent yeah. fruit where the overall ovary um, wall ripens into a soft peric pericarp. Pericarp. Um, the seeds within the berry are embedded within the flesh of a single ovary, and there is typically more than one seed to each berry. Some examples of the botan botanical um, berries differ from tomatoes, grapes, avocados, and persimmon. Okay, persimmon. And that's a picture of like different berries. I see that. Have you ever eaten a persimmon? No, I haven't. I, I periodically see them in the stores. I mean, they're a native plant. They're, and I thought about putting one in my yard, but I don't know if I like them because I've never eaten them. So I'd like to eat one before I put a tree in. Yeah. <laughs> so strawberries and raspberries are not considered berries. Um, blackberries and boysenberries are, are referred to as um, aggregate fruits, aggregate. Uh, ag aggregate fruits, meaning they develop, um, from several ovaries. For example, strawberries and raspberries would not be considered berries from a botanical view, um, because they come from a flower with more than one ovary. Um, true, true berries stem from one flower with one ovary along with a plentiful of seeds. And then I just had a YouTube video, which obviously we can't show. And I would love to, trust me. This is yeah. very frustrating. It's okay. But yes, so I, I marked down that you had one. So okay. you credit for trying it. I'll look at them later. Okay. Yeah. So okay. a Samara. Okay. So a Samara is a dry fruit that contains one seed that is surrounded by a papery tissue that allows the seed to be carried away from the tree by the wind. Um, it doesn't split open. Therefore, it is considered an in the hissing fruit. In the hissing fruit. Yeah, so you have a picture. Yeah, that's a, a picture of a maple samara. So you can see that there's two seeds, two large, uh, large elevated bumps at the base of of the pedestal here, mm -hmm. and then you have the wings. But they also have one seeded one, such as what you would have for your elms. Mm -hmm. okay, next. So the helicopter-like effect in the wind. I love so, it. Yeah, okay, go it ahead. is a flowering plant that produces fruits after blooming. It has a wing-like shape that allows it to spin within the air as the wind blows, creating a helicopter-like effect. As a kid, you would probably you probably would have thrown some Samara um, leaves like this, fruits or leaves from a maple tree um, in the air to watch them spin back down to the ground. So you may have called 
um, than helicopters or whirly birds. And this was a video of what it looks like when it's spinning in the air. Another YouTube video, but yeah, I know. That's you did you do that when you were a child? Yes, I did, but without even knowing that this is what it was. Yeah, I think that's sort of natural. It's like blowing dandelion seeds. Yeah. Okay. okay. So transpiration. So transpiration is the loss of water within a plant um, in the form of water evaporation. Actively growing plants um, continuously have water evaporating from the surface of leaf cells due to air exposure. Um, water is absorbed by roots through the soil and then transported as a liquid to the leaves via xalem. Um, as that liquid travels through the plant, it will convert into a gas through the process of evaporation. And to the left, you can see a demonstration of transpiration. So the um, cohesion theory of sap ascent, um, the cohesion properties of water allow the liquid to be pulled up through the plant as the water molecules evaporate from the leaf surface. This process has been termed as the cohesion theory of sap ascent in plants. And then I had a vid video of a demonstration of that, but to the right, you can see a breakdown of it. Okay, they also sometimes call it the tension cohesion theory. Okay. So ethylene, ethylene, ethylene. Yeah. Ethylene is a hormone that is produced by plants um, that helps aid the process of ripening and aging without within plants. It is known as the first gaseous plant, gaseous. Gaseous, gaseous plant, sorry, produced hormone and is naturally occurring um, and is a naturally occurring gas that can also occur through the process of com combustion, along with other methods. Um, it could be found in tissues of riper ripening fruits, um, notes of stems. Fenison. Venison leaves and flowers. And that's just a demonstration of tomatoes in the ripening stage of the tomatoes. Venison basically means they're dying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So the chemical structure of eth ethylene? Ethylene. 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 Um, it is produced by the degrad de degradation of methylene. Degradation, yeah. Okay. Uh, and amino acid. The sex of flowers. Monoecious. 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 Plants contain both male and female flowers is determined by gibber, gibberlins. Gibberlins as gibberlins. well as yeah. ethylene. Okay. Um, and gibberlins is the male flower and ethylene is the female flower. And then this is like the chemical breakdown there to the right. And then I ha also had a YouTube video to demonstrate further. Okay. It's interesting. I like that. Okay. I think that was it, but I'm not sure. All right. Do you have your citations or on this? or I there, think there I put the citations. Okay. Is uh, there not another slide? No, it's telling me that's it. Just email me that. Oh, wait. Okay. Don't email me because now I, seriously, I have over 110 student emails I haven't got a chance to read yet. So, so please put that in your assignment folder then because okay. I can access things easier that way. Okay. Okay. All right. Very nicely Thanks. done. Though. Okay. Maybe one day we'll be able to do the YouTubes and everything. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, darn. Dane, you said you were good to go. Dane, you have mic access, I hope. Dane. Oops. Yes, but your mic isn't working. Okay, if I do this wrong, let me know. Oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. I know, I know, I pulled the wrong one. It's up in the wrong, wrong folder. Uh, where am I at? I meant to go for that. Darn, where are you? There you are. 
There you are, right there. All right, so here we have this. So you take your plan project notes again. This is barley. The scientific name of the genus is called Hordium. And this is Dane Lu's presentation. So you can see in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a grain of barley, which for most people looks very, very much like a wheat uh, wheat stalk. And then you can see that you've got the raw kernels right below there in a bowl. So scientific name is Hordium. Um, not really showing genus and species. Uh, there are both annual and perennial plants of barley available and then Showing the growth stages of barley, you start one with your seeds, then you go to your seedlings, uh, finally your young plants that are producing uh, more full, fuller greens. The plants continue to grow as they're ready, uh, getting ready to fully mature. They turn a more yellow shade, then eventually they turn a tan or brown shade, and at that stage they can be harvested. So description of the plant. The barley is a young leaf of the barley plant, and here he has the genus, again, Hordium. In this case, he's added the species, which is Vulgari. Uh, barley grass happens to be rich in chlorophyll and antioxidants, which is why it's used for nutritional uh, value as well as this, uh, the seed itself. So it's a tall grass, hairy stem. Uh, basically, it has epidermal hairs, and it stands erect, produces spikelets. So these... Oops. Back up. These uh, expanded parts at the top are called spikelets. These are the fruits. Within the fruits are the seeds. Um, and the stems are made up of nodes and internodes. You remember those terms from when we were reviewing uh, bot uh, botanical structures and anatomy. Uh, sorry, morphology. So the overall shape and form, the wheat is a bunch grass. It produces what's called upright tillers. And the uh, leaves have uh, leaves are rolled in a whirl. Okay, flowers. It does have, but it doesn't have in the tech, in the literal sense of what most people think of as flower. It has a very very small flower. It basically a wind pollinated plant, so it doesn't need anything showy. Fruit. Uh, the barley itself. Uh, what you saw there in the spikelet, those are fruits, and within the, each of those, there's a seed. Uh, cones is not applicable. Uh, mature size, again, uh, it's annual. It bunches together rather than being a spreading grass, and then it's about two to four feet tall, depending on the uh, variety that you pick. The center of origin is Egypt, Ethiopia, Near East, or Tibet. Current distribution is expanded. Uh, these are the states within the U.S. that are currently growing it. So you went from uh, something from the Arabic uh, Peninsula, uh, Africa area, and into what is now more of a worldwide crop, specifically in the U.S. It's being grown in the central U.S. and uh, west. So how the plant is used. The grain of barley can be used to make medicine. Uh, for lowering your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, similar to the way you would use oats. Uh, it's also used for digestive complaints, including diarrhea, stomach pain, pain, inflammatory bowel conditions, also similar to what you would use oats for. Possible disadvantages. If you have celiac disease or if you're gluten sensitive, this has gluten in it, unlike oats. So the gluten in barley can, can make a celiac disease uh, worse, so you avoid using it. Uh, allergies to cereal grains can become more, more severe over time, especially if you're sensitive to other cereal grains, similar to what you would see if you were allergic to one type of nut 
you would tend to become allergic to others as well. Growth barley uh, is barley grass itself is used for juicing, um, so you can use it at <coughs> two different stages of growth. Uh, the leaves for juicing, those should be green, and then the uh, spikelets, the mature grain, uh, has to be mature and dry at that time. So two different stages. So juicing uh, technique involves planting lots of seeds in a plastic tray, raising them indoors. Uh, outdoor cultivation can be more difficult in different climates. Uh, barley sprouts fairly well, <clears throat> but cold weather outside will kill it. Again, you can grow it indoors uh, in the trays for the grass. Growing for the grain, the best time to plant is February, so we're past that time for this year. So history of the plant. So this is one of the first cultivated plants grown uh, particularly in Eurasia as early as 10,000 years ago, so around the time of the beginning of civilization. It's been used as animal fodder, a source of fermentable material for beer and uh, certain distilled beverages for which it provides a different component of flavor and as well as alcohol and a component of various health foods such as your barley grass. So barley water has also been used for various medicinal purposes since ancient times. So here's your care and growth requirements. Again, your hardiness zone is eight. So I can't grow it here in Pennsylvania. You can't grow it there in New Jersey. But if you were down in South Carolina, Georgia, you could grow it. Uh, barley is very, very fine seed head. Uh, hardiness zone doesn't matter if you're growing it indoors, but it matters if you have it outdoors. So very fine seed bed, loamy soil, plenty of sunlight. It prefers not more alkaline or neutral uh, pH. So it's, you don't want as low as a six, which is more close for general purposes of gardening. Minimum temperature is 34 to 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, seasonal water requirement for barley depends on the variety. Uh, it tends to be drought resistant, which is convenient. And then your maximum water use will occur for 21 to 28 days during seed heading or spikelet formation. So, so there is a video link. So, Dane, what does the video link say? Can you put it in chat? Dane, you're there? About harvesting barley. Thank you. So, he has a video about harvesting barley. Okay, now, uh, interesting facts. Whole grain of barley contains 70% starch. Oh. Two to 3% it's and approximately 2.5% minerals. Uses whole grain pearls for production of breakfast cereals, stews, soups, pasta, noodles. It's a coffee substitute in porridges and baked products such as bread and flatbread. So, question How many of you have ever eaten barley? Knowing. Other than, than in beer. I have eaten. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think of it? What's it taste like? It's pretty nice. Annika. Okay, we good? All right. Now, everybody's presented everything they were supposed to present, right? Because after a certain point in time, I've lost track. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Um, were these vocabulary for vocabulary? These, uh, these vocab nine? the vocabulary words were going towards test number two. They were an integral. Uh, thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Um, well, what vocab the, the, was, the, it? was it? Vocab the, nine. 
the vocabulary words actually went through unit seven, eight, and nine. Those were the ones that were actually for test two, and then because of various things and people getting things in at different times and whatever, that was the remnant of that. Um, and then we had the Earth Day, uh, Earth Day presentations, and then we had the two plant project presentations. So we had a mix. Okay. So now, since I have to grade all of these, and I've graded the test one and test two that I received today, uh, for test two assessment, I, there were three parts. One, two. I've graded what I could of one and two. If I don't have three, I can't give you a grade for the whole thing, other than just discounting that portion as, as a zero. So if you haven't sent that in yet, put that in Moodle for me, because I, I'm in the process of grading now. Um, okay. So anything that I don't have, test three is the one that's going to be on Monday. Yes. So your final is test three. Your because be because of of us having to go online when we did, you didn't have, you did not have lab practicals. Your lab two lab practicals together were supposed to count fifteen percent of your grade. Since we didn't have that opportunity, in lieu of that, and I told you at the beginning of going online, your lab practical grade, which is fifteen percent of your grade, and your lab notebook grade, which is I believe also fifteen percent of your grade. So thirty percent of your grade now comes from whatever is in your lab notebook. So that actually counts a great deal. So just so you know that, and that takes me the longest time to grade because there's a lot of individual pieces and I'm getting things in at different folders and I'm getting things by email. So it's going to take me the longest time to grade. Um, That's fine. I will find it, but my preference, and unless you absolutely cannot get into Moodle, please do not email me. Thanks. Okay. Because at this point in time, it's going to take me forever to get through things to grade. And the, the administration being, being recognizing the difficulty with students not being able to get things in on time for various personal and career and work and health reasons and professors accepting, for the most part, that, that work. We're inundated. We get no sleep. I know you guys don't get sleep either. We get no sleep either. So they're giving us a little bit more time than we'd normally have to get grades in because we physically can't do it all. Yeah. So, so. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I tried submitting everything into Moodle, but it's just the sheer amount of copies I have didn't fit. So I had to email it to you. I wanted to know how do you want me to, I just put everything into email because not everything would fit. Uh, okay. Now, right now I have, I, I put up a new um, lab notebook assignments folder too. It should have taken whatever you had. It said the max was 20. And you, in and, and in, in the second lab notebook folder, you exceeded that? Uh. Uh, the most recent one I exceeded, yes. Wow. I'll to see what's wrong with that because it was supposed to take everything. I'll, I'll look at it. But like I say, if you sent me something in email, honestly, it's going to take me a long time to get to it. Okay. Got it. Okay. And, I would, and I would rather address those things within Moodle and then just have the email for more urgent things or notifications I'll, or whatever. I'll, I'll resubmit everything then. Or I, well, I, I, I hate to ask you to do that, but seriously, I'm drowning in stuff right now. That's fine. I understand. Okay. All right. We good then? Um, I have another question. Um, you know, I was just organizing my labs and stuff. Right. To see what I have, what I don't have. Um, right. And there's three labs specifically that I'm just not sure about. Because I, I don't have these written. Uh, the okay, I, I, will, I will tell you that there is that little interval right before spring break where you gave me things and I didn't have them graded yet. I have copies of those. 
That's wow. all I have copies of. So everything else, what I really want you to do and what would make life so much easier for me is if you would go ahead and that sheet that I gave you of everything that's supposed to be in your lab notebook, mm -hmm. if, if you if you basically go through that, it, it's in a doc so you can change it. Bold everything that you have. Leave anything you don't have unbolded. Okay. Okay. Then I will know to look for it if I don't have a record of it. Okay. Gotcha. Right. That would, if everyone would do that, that would make my life so much easier. Okay. Just a simple thing there. So do that. Go ahead and fill out that daily observation essay table of contents for me. Okay. And then we should be good. All right. Yeah. All right. So, so what can you expect on Monday? Okay. Good question. On Monday, you should be prepared to do. You should be prepared to do a daily observation essay that's not like any of the other ones that you've done. And I will explain that that day. I always explain that the last day. Mm -hmm. So you'll have your daily observation essay. You will have sent into Moodle, hopefully into a lab, lab assignment folder, a photo of your extra credit plan. I will at that point in time, the third test always covers unit 10, 11, and 12. I will at that point in time have short essay questions that you are to do within the time frame of the class and submit to me immediately after the class ends on Moodle. That is your final test. Again, they will cover units 10, 11, and 12. You have the PowerPoint, you have the vocab. It's based on those. So are we are we meeting like in on the yes, class yes, Monday? yes, we are absolutely meeting for the last class. I always meet for the last class so that we can tie up any loose ends. Okay. So we are definitely meeting. Hopefully, I mean, you have three hours for class. They will be short answer essays. Again, this is part of the reason that we're all going nuts because we can't give you Scantron tests. So we have to do ones that take longer to grade. You have a short answer essay. I will explain roughly what a short answer means. A short answer is not a single sentence, not a paraphrase. A, a short answer is something that's probably the equivalent of about a half a page, a third to a half a page. So it's going to be running roughly 35 to 100 words. And you will have a series of those, no more than 10, probably nine, but I haven't decided yet. I haven't written this yet. Okay, so I can't tell you exactly what it's on other than I can tell you that it covers units 10, 11, and 12, PowerPoints and vocab. Okay? Yeah. All right. So is everybody good then? Yeah. Um, yes. The notes that we took today, are they going into the second assignment file thing? Go ahead and, for the sake of, of ease of me not having to put up another thing, anything that you have remaining at this point in time that I do not already have, please put into the second lab notebook folder, including okay. your final exam, including your extra credit plant photo, everything. Okay. Okay, so if I don't already have it, that's where I want it. And this is also where you're going to put that copy that I gave you of the list of everything that's supposed to be in your lab notebook with you having bolded everything that you actually submitted and it, the, your list with your names for each of your daily observation essays that you submitted. And I will cross-reference that with what I have to verify that I've got everything. Okay. Wait, so apart from the sheet that we have for the daily observation essays, we're supposed to... Um, yes, I, I, I gave you, I, I have, I believe, yeah, I did put it on Moodle. I put on Moodle a daily observation essay table of contents. Very identical yeah, to the I one that you that got one. the first day of class, other than I, I noted that COVID-19 lost us a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, 
the other one that I have up there is a list of everything that should be in a lab notebook. Normally, you would physically give me this. This is obviously not happening. So what I mm -hmm. need you to do so that I can go through this in any reasonable period of time is I need you to bold each and every, you, you can use a typeface bold, however you're going to do it. Bold everything you actually did. So okay. I won't be looking for something that does not exist in your portfolio. Okay. Okay. All right, this is, this is very scattered for all of us, and I am so sorry I would not have chosen to have COVID-19 or anything like that any time in the next zillion years. But thank you for bearing with this. I know it's not easy for you doing this online. It is not a preferred method for most things. Okay. okay. All right. All right, we good? Yes? Yeah, just okay. to reconfirm, um, the vocab, the yes. um, presentation vocabs was on vocab seven, eight, and nine, correct? Yes, the one that you did your PowerPoint was on strictly unit seven, eight, and nine. And I debated about doing similar things for the final. I think at this point in time, I think it was fine for seven, eight, and nine. I think for the most part, you guys did a really bang up job on it. But for the final, I want to do something different. Okay. Okay. That's fine. All right, we good? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Now. Rule of thumb, very, very important. All of you absolutely have to stay healthy. Okay? Yeah. Promise me you'll do your best. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. We will see you next Monday then. Okay. okay. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.